The good folks at Comics for Fun and Profit have been doing two episodes a week um, for quite some time now, and it's all thanks to, first of all, Jason, and second of all, our patrons, who allow us to add the space on our server, broadcast more, store more, share more with you listeners. I'm envious of those of you who have unlimited storage and media server capabilities. We, we pay for ours here at, at the C4FAP. It ain't cheap. We thank you so much for those of you who go to patreon.com slash comics fun profit and contribute at any level to say thanks, to say I want to be a part of your Slack channel conversations. I want to get exclusives. I want to get early access. I want to get ad free access. I want to get swag. I want to get some free stuff. Whatever your reasoning is, we appreciate it at any level because it does make a difference. So from the bottom of Kyle and I and Jason's heart, thank you for contributing. Aloha. This is Jason from Hawaii. Welcome to a special edition of the Comics for Fun and Profit podcast. In this episode, I will be interviewing writer Matthew Clickstein. He is here to promote his new book, See You at San Diego, an oral history of Comic-Con, fandom, and the triumph of the geek culture. Now, this book is by Fanagraphics. Now, this now for me, I've read and you know, I've read some of the book. It's incredible. This is a time capsule softback book that is um, 480 pages. It's filled with amazing pictures and it tells the story of Comic-Con warts and all from the early grassroots um, beginnings to present day. Matthew, it is an honor to have you on the Comics for Fun and Profit podcast. I'm going to ask you two questions. First off, how are you doing today? Doing just fine. Thank you, Jason. And you know what? And I forgot to ask you this before we started recording. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? You did. Thank you. You're actually one of the few who who does. Honestly, it's not that big a deal for me. In fact, I used to, when I was very young, I, I went by Matt Clickstein because I was weirdly obsessed with Frankenstein. I used to always dress up uh -huh. as him for Halloween. And I used to take out all these books on old monster movies from the library when I was a kid to the point that the librarian and my third grade teacher had a meeting with my mom about it because they were worried I was reading too much about monsters to which my mom of course responded let me get this straight you had me come to school to talk to me because you're worried my son reads too much um so uh yeah but I noticed my dad always said click steam and <laughs> I started realizing maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong and I actually asked my grandfather at one point mm -hmm how it was pronounced and he said he didn't know either uh you know don't want to go down the rabbit hole really here but you know jewish so a lot of us our names were given to us yes. at Ellis island and they weren't always <laughs> we didn't really you know they were sort of made up so yes um i did once read a, an essay by tom wolf though where he interviewed leonard bernstein and bernstein claimed that Stein is the original Jewish and Steen is like the Americanized version of it. Oh. Um, so I don't know, but personally, I don't really care, but it is funny because a lot of times people will ask me before an interview, is it Steen or Stein? Yeah. They say Steen and they inevitably usually say Stein anyway. Mm -hmm. I also get Clickenstein a lot, probably because it's similar to Frankenstein. Yeah. So I appreciate that you got it right the first time without even asking. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to go over your brief history, you know, to let listeners know, to check out your other works. And, you know, as you mentioned before, we did, we recorded that you wrote the book um, Slime, an oral history of Nickelodeon's Golden Age. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. I That came out through Penguin Random House in 2013. Mm -hmm. There's also an audiobook version of it. And I uh -huh. still don't know how this happened, but it was actually a clue on Jeopardy just a few weeks ago. Um, it was literally the question had something to do with subtitled books. That uh -huh. mine, mine was one of them. They said slime. They said Nickelodeon. I don't. And I, I actually don't watch Jeopardy. Uh, yeah. so I had friends all over the country texting me about it and saying, hey, did you know your book was on Jeopardy? And even a friend of mine who I had no idea watched Jeopardy either. He records mm -hmm. every episode. Yes. So he actually filmed it on his phone when That's it happened. Nice. And so I got to see it. But yeah, I, so yeah, so Slimed, 
Slime was, I did a few other smaller books before that, um, but Slime was really my first big book that really kind of mm. kickstarted my career as a pop culture historian. Um, and uh, yeah, for that one, we talked to 250 people. We got Mark Summers, of course, from Double Dare to do the forward. Mm -hmm. um, some really great pictures in that one too. That, that's, that's probably one of the books that I'm most known for. Uh, it's like the only book really on Nickelodeon aside from some academic texts that came out. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. So yeah, I did do slimed. <laughs> okay. And then also too, on the comic book side, for Aftershock, um, you wrote the comic book um, limited series, You Are Obsolete. Is that, did I, I did, yeah. That came out uh, two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the OGN came out during COVID, which was interesting, oh. um, especially because it dealt with a lot of issues that kind of turned out to be very prescient about screens and about technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's basically the, the, log, the easy log line is it's essentially children of the corn but instead of the Bible or religion, it's uh, cell phones. Uh, it's just, you know, it was just this idea I had. I was originally pitching it around as a film. I was mm -hmm. getting a lot of really positive feedback on it. But of course, getting a film made, uh, especially these days, is extremely difficult yes. and um, for the finances. And I had a number of friends in the comic book industry, including Tim Seeley, who mm -hmm. later would be part of this book, See You at San Diego. Mm -hmm. And Tim and a few other people helped me to connect me to Aftershock. Uh, with whom they'd worked before. A couple of my other friends had done some stuff for them also. And they were very welcoming over there. And um, I had actually never written a comic book. I, the funny thing is I don't really read comic books. I didn't mm -hmm. then or now. Um, I like underground comics quite a <laughs> lot and certain other like graphic novels and things yeah. like that. But regular comic books have never really been my jam. Um, so they actually had to have me learn how to write one because they knew I could do scripts and I'd done mm -hmm. film and television and theater and obviously a lot of books and articles, but never a, a comic book script. Mm -hmm. So they actually sent me a few just to see if I could do it. And I wrote mm -hmm. the first uh, issue actually completely on spec, totally on my own without any development. Mm -hmm. And they loved it and they bought the whole series. And then I worked on the next uh, four, mm -hmm. it was five all together with, with an editor, Christina Harrington, and some of the other people at Aftershock kind of helped me out. There, there wasn't too many notes. I mean, I really uh, was able to translate the work that I'd done in film and television and theater to comic books pretty mm -hmm. pretty easily. And like I said, although I'm, I'm not really into the mainstream comics, I do read underground and graphic novels. So I had a, an idea. And, and they're, you know, it's essentially like film on, on the page. Yes. So I knew yeah. how to talk, how to explain how I wanted to look. And I worked mm -hmm. closely with the art department. And I sent them, um, you know, samples of pictures and images that they can use. Yeah. I wanted it to reference a lot of 70s and 80s horror films and Twilight Zone. So I would send them clips from different movies and images. And, and they did. I mean, you can look. I mean, the front cover of You Are Obsolete, you can tell, is a bit of a rip from um, John Carpenter's version of Village of the Damned. Mm -hmm. And there's yes. that are right out of like Poltergeist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even mm -hmm. the third issue is very much the rubric of the cover and mm -hmm. because I told them to is based very much on an old Spanish film from 1973 called Who Could Kill a Child. Um, and actually there's a Spanish language version of the OGN. And I saw yeah. some people in Spanish language countries talking about um, that, that cover. And, and I wanted it to be self-referential. They're talking about movies a lot. So I wanted it to be very obvious mm -hmm. that we were kind of paying homage, not ripping off, but paying homage to these other films and television shows, and especially Twilight Zone was a big one for me, so. That's nice. Okay, so Matt, I'm going to say, because you've already covered a couple things that what started off, um, like literally the history of, um, of Comic-Con, you know, monster books, underground comics, and so forth, and so, but um, I'm going to say, um, I'm just going to go, um, uh, let me just finish up with a couple more things. I just want to point out is I want to give a shout out, you know, um, a big shout out to Hannah Bahedri of Superfan Promotions for setting up this interview and for an advanced reading copy. So Hannah, thank you very much. Matthew, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, there's a million people to thank. Anyone who's seen the book knows that the acknowledgement section is about four or five pages long and it's mm -hmm. yes. it's not just a 480 page book as, as you've seen it's it's big it's very tall like everyone who sees it is amazed by how big it is including myself when i first mm -hmm. got a copy of it i had no idea it was going to be that huge mm -hmm. um and it's double columns so yes. i had a lot of people to thank who really helped me to get this going for this particular interview definitely i mean obviously yourself uh definitely hannah um, David Hyde, uh, mm -hmm. who's her boss, who who runs Superfan, and he's been great. Uh, Gary Groff, my publisher, of course, who was also mm -hmm. the yes. editor on it, and we've become very good friends. I'm now going to be working with him on another project. I can talk about that later yeah. if you want. 
Um, so definitely Gary and, uh, you know, just all the people at Fantagraphics who helped make this happen. Um, and if I named every single person who's in the book or who helped me make the book, again, I'd have to read about six pages of double column, 12. <laughs> you know, so uh, I'll just say, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful of everyone who helped me to put this together. And, uh, you know, it was a challenging time, especially since it came from originally, uh, you know, the podcast series of Sirius XM uh, yes. Comic-Con Begins that we did. Uh -huh literally during COVID. In fact, we started it right at the height of that. So that was mm -hmm. been a very intense last three years doing mm -hmm. the podcast and now the book. Yeah. And uh, there's even an audio book version that just came out uh, through mm -hmm. a company called Blackstone. So I've been really living in this story for a very long time. And even before that, like I said, even though I'm not a big comics guy, mm -hmm. I've always been very interested in comics as a community. Mm -hmm, I've always yes. read a lot of biographies and autobiographies mm -hmm. and interviews with people like Alan Moore and obviously people like Kirby and Stan mm -hmm, Lee yes. and others, uh, Neil Adams. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm more like an anthropologist. I'm, I'm not as interested in the work, but I'm very mm -hmm. interested in the people and the community. Frank Miller. I mean, a lot of the mm -hmm. people even that I got in the book, I'm fascinated by who they are as people mm -hmm. and what they're doing on as like almost like a movement mm -hmm. as opposed to the actual work itself. Um, you know, there's some classic, you know, or, or modern classics, if you will, comic series that I've enjoyed. I love The Killing Joke, for example. Mm -hmm. yes. um, uh, you know, good, good Alan Moore one and um, a few others. I, I, I bought, you know, a Death of Superman comic when it came out in yeah. Um, so, you know, I, 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 and I would always hang out. I, I like to say this too. I would always hang out at comic book shops when I was a kid. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's part of why I made the book the way that it is where I really focus on the community. Yes. And I've always told people that though I wasn't really into comics as a kid, I still hung out at comic book shops a lot mm -hmm. because that's where all the other geeks were. Yes. And especially some of the older ones who would tell me like, they weren't just talking about comics. They were talking about movies. They were talking mm -hmm. about TV shows. Yes. They were talking about animation, anime, yeah. manga, mm -hmm. tabletop games. And mm -hmm. unlike record stores and video stores, which I also like poking into, mm -hmm. what's great about the comic book shop, of course, is there are people hanging out and there's mm -hmm. tables mm -hmm. and people are playing games and there's yes. TVs on with like oftentimes really cool stuff, old movies and, mm -hmm. and old TV and, and yeah. great old animation. It's not sports, you know, it's, it's yes, cool yeah. that, that, that we like. And so, um, I would end up really hanging out at comic book shops. So even though I wasn't reading a lot of that stuff, uh, it, it, it still filtered through kind of through mimos, uh, through like a, a mimetic kind of a thing going on mm -hmm. and uh, osmosis. And, you know, so, and that's kind of how I wanted the book to be too, where uh -huh. I was really focusing less on the materials and more on the community. Yes. And that someone who's not really that into comics mm -hmm. could still be very much a part of this and be very interested in it. I will say I've always been a huge science fiction guy. So that's kind of my nice. more hardcore kind of yeah. traditional geek geek mm -hmm. uh, cred is you know i watched twilight zone since i was a child my mom mm -hmm. and i used to watch it together you know four or five years old um love ray bradbury love isaac asimov and mm -hmm. arthur c clark and philip k dick mm -hmm. um people like that so I've, i i definitely have my geek cred on a more hardcore level with the science fiction that's that's something that i'm very pure on so <laughs> i'm gonna um I, i'm gonna touch upon that when we start getting in more when you know like the early days and listeners basically i mean we own i only have some we only have so little time i'm sure. just gonna sorry i know up. i talk a lot no 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 <laughs> Matt, no no yeah girl is <laughs> no 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 because the thing is because for listeners like you know um i, I just want to give the listeners an idea of like where the this book is great um yeah, like i said i just want to focus on like just the early days of how it came about and then just go ahead and pick up the book because like I said, it's in, because me and Matthew are talking like we could do this, this whole episode could be four or five hours long. I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. So um, Matthew, I'm going to ask like what inspired, because like you said, you're like an anthropologist, you know, and so forth. What inspired you to write this book? Like what was the thing that kicked it off for you? As, as we were just talking about, I did the Nickelodeon book, um, yeah. as you know, and maybe some of your listeners know, I also did something similar about The Simpsons yeah. with Mike Reese, who's one of two people who's written for the show since it started, yes. uh, Springfield Confidential. It's not quite an oral history, but I did have an opportunity to interview a lot of other people like Conan O'Brien mm -hmm. and Dan Castellaneta, the voice of Homer, and Nancy Cartwright, the voice of Bart Simpson, of course, for that book. And I've done a lot of articles and things over the years as well. 
um, documentaries. I, uh, you know, I, I, I call myself and have been called a pop culture historian along mm-hmm. with a few other friends of mine, um, some of whom are in the book, like Cassine Gaines, who does similar projects on like Back to the Future and mm-hmm. he just had an ET book. So there's a kind of a, a handful of us who really take this stuff very seriously. And it's very important for us because of course, as you know, whether it's podcasts, even documentaries, certainly books and articles these days, it seems like over the last few years, a lot of the people who are engaging in these materials are doing it from a much more subjective and personal Mm -hmm. um, place, you know, which, you know, sometimes has its place, but, you know, if I'm going to watch a movie or read a book on say the wonder years, Mm -hmm. for example, I don't necessarily want to watch a movie or read a book on what that author, what the filmmaker has to say themselves about wonder years. And maybe they throw in a couple of random interviews. I really want everyone who's involved to Mm -hmm. talk about it and really have the, the text, whether again, it's a documentary podcast or a book, that's going to be the resource. It's going Mm -hmm. to be the encyclopedia for that. And unfortunately, you know, this is a whole other discussion, but a lot of, a lot of it's for marketing reasons and social media and whatnot, influencer ecosystem. There's just not a lot of them these days. And, Mm -hmm. you know, some of it is they take a lot of time. They're a Mm -hmm. lot of work. Look, if I were going to write, you know, a bunch of personal essays about what I think about Comic-Con, that would have taken me a month. But Mm -hmm. to do it as a real resource that PhD students are going to be using for their thesis and that Mm -hmm. years from now when other people kind of catch on to what this resource is, Mm -hmm. it's going to be all over the place. Like the Nickelodeon book has been and the Simpsons book has been just takes some time. You know, I want it to be very accurate. I really want it to be the people who made it. And so where I'm going with all this is I... I take pop culture history very seriously. Mm -hmm. I always have. I was the kid in elementary school who was reading books about Chuck Jones and George Burns and Mm -hmm. all different kinds of things at a very young age. And I wanted to do that kind of stuff. Cassine and some of my other friends have similar stories of they were Mm -hmm. reading books about Twilight Zone and such as a kid. And so that's why they wanted to do it. Um, And I realized, what can I do that would be kind of the ultimate pop culture history book that would sort of bring all of this together, all the different fandom fiefdoms together, Mm -hmm. All the different communities, Star Wars, Star Trek, comic books, science fiction, Mad Magazine, Rick and Morty, cartoons, animation, Twilight, Twilight Zone, all of it. And, and I realized that, comic, yeah, yeah, in comics, yeah, certainly comics, DC, Marvel, everything, underground comics. What can I do to really tell the full story in mm-hmm. a way that would work and that wouldn't take me 100 years and that mm-hmm. wouldn't be 50,000 pages? Mm-hmm. And I realized I could do it through the lens of the prehistory, history and expansion. Yes. of the largest pop culture gathering worldwide, which according yes. to the Guinness Book of World Records twice in the last few years mm-hmm. is Comic-Con, is San Diego mm-hmm. Comic-Con. Mm-hmm. I happen to know somebody, Wendy All, A-L-L, who was one of the original committee members. Yes. Mm-hmm. She's all over the book, as you've seen. Yes. Um, and she connect, She and I were old friends. I'd interviewed her a lot. I, oh. She was somebody that I was close with. And she helped me to get in touch with everybody and kind of came on as my historical consultant oh. and agreed Mm -hmm. After the 50th anniversary of Comic-Con, now was the time to do it, especially as, you know, sad but true, we're starting to lose people. And it's like, we got to get this stuff down now. And again, that's why it was so important for me, not only to do it and to do it now Mm -hmm. and to get as many people involved as possible before they're gone, but why, again, I didn't want to just do it as kind of my take on it. I really Mm -hmm. wanted their story. I don't, Mm -hmm. I almost don't even like calling myself on a project like this, like the writer or the author, they're the writers, they're Uh the, they're the storytellers. I'm really more of a curator or an editor cutting it all together. Um, if this were a documentary, I would be, you know, the director, yes. producer. Um, but I don't necessarily know if I'd call myself writer per se. Um, but um, yeah, so that's that's where it came from. I wanted to do the ultimate pop culture history book, mm-hmm. and this was that. And then that's the perfect segue because we were talking because I wanted you to describe the format of the book because I I, I just I, I didn't know how to it, because listeners it's not just the typical you know in 1973 in August we met at this bar thing oh and also so how do how do you describe the format of the book you, yeah. you mentioned it's like so it's as oral, mm-hmm. sure sure as per the subtitle it's an oral history uh, which is a relatively new literary form I mean in some ways it does go back at least as far as people like Studs Terkel. Um, and books on people like Edie Sedgwick and Truman Capote that were done in the 50s and 60s and later on. Um, Legs McNeil did an incredible oral history back in the 90s called Please Kill Me about punk rock. 
Um, there's a guy named James Andrew Miller, who's something of a hero of mine, who's done mm-hmm. huge oral histories on everything from Saturday Night Live to ESPN to just recently HBO. Um, and what it is, is it, it, the best way to t- say it is if you think about it as a Talking Heads documentary where you have all the different interviewees who are talking mm-hmm. and telling their story. It's all cut together. Yes. Maybe you have some archival stuff, whatever. But really, the focus is all the people and their interviews. Yes. So I, did the, I do the exact same thing, except instead of a documentary, it's a book. So think mm-hmm. of it as if this were a documentary, but I transcribed all the interviews yes. after they have been cut together. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my work, aside from the prudisorial stuff where I'm getting everyone and, and tracking them down and setting mm-hmm. up interviews and doing the interviews and such is really taking all the transcripts of all their interviews. So I'll talk to each person for two or three hours sometimes, mm-hmm. um, do some pickups occasionally. Hey, yeah. someone said this about this. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me about that? And so mm-hmm. I'll go back to the same person sometimes a couple of times. Once I have all the interviews done, I transcribe it all and mm-hmm. then I cut them together just like I'd be cutting together a documentary, except mm-hmm. instead of cutting film or video, I'm cutting the actual words mm-hmm. to tell the whole story. A really good example of what I mean, and then I can wrap this up here, is there's a really great part that I love just for the format, which is I talked to Kevin Eastman, the co-creator of Teenage Mutant Teenage Turtles, and Stan Sakai, who also did our forward, the co-creator, the creator of Usagi Ojimbo. Mm-hmm. And they both, during their interviews, partly intentionally on my part, but partly they just talked about it, discussed when Stan's Usagi Ojimbo ended up becoming a part of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles universe, as Mm -hmm. most people probably know who are listening to this, and really how that helped Stan and helped Usagi really get out there on a larger level. Mm -hmm. And they both talked about it in a very similar way, Mm because it was a similar story, and I kind of cut them together back and forth, almost like a ping pong match. Yeah. And it, as you said before, we started the the recording and a lot of other people said, too, it really feels like you're almost there. So it mm-hmm. would feel like you're sitting at a bar or a coffee shop with Stan Sakai and Kevin Eastman. Mm-hmm. And they're almost completing each other's sentences. Yes. And that that was really for me, the work that I have to do is a to make sure to get those interviews done right. But mm-hmm. also later to cut them together in a way that not only tells the full story, mm-hmm. but in a way that flows well, that keeps mm-hmm. it moving, that's yes. organic, that's not going to get sluggish, mm-hmm. um, and that and that it doesn't feel like it's too. It almost feels like one person's talking, rather mm-hmm. than two people going back and forth. Yeah. Um, so, and that's that's the kind of thing I did throughout the entire book. Also, the opposite is true, which I really like about oral histories as well. Which is there are times, as you've seen probably in the book, where people disagree with each other. Also, yeah. like what would happen if you were at a coffee shop or a bar with some of these people? Yeah. Um, you know, there are times where someone might say something and someone else says, no, it didn't happen like that. It happened mm-hmm. like this. Yes. And that happens frequently. And that's a big part, too, why I both like to write and to read mm-hmm. oral histories, because it's oftentimes very hard, if not impossible, to know exactly what happened, yeah. especially yeah. with something like the early days of Comic-Con. We're talking about a bunch of kids. We're talking about 50 years ago. Nothing was recorded. Nothing was written down. Uh-huh. They barely even had anyone taking pictures or anything or any film or video. Of course, video wasn't even really around yet. Uh-huh. So a lot of it's just based on people's memories and yeah. people's memories are different. And yeah. or, or someone might say, no, it didn't happen quite like that. And, and so that's really the fun of an oral history is both people can kind of be bouncing back and forth, but also people can kind of uh, mm-hmm. exaggerate each other's stuff or or disagree with each other contradict each other and I think that's really important to tell the full story it is it's and listeners it is um you know um um you know um I, I just want to say this because I want to start getting into the book Matthew but like I said this book is great I just feel like I was I felt like when I'm reading this, I, I felt like I was I I thought I was like sitting at the table with the all these you know founding members uh, committee members it was great um and it's warts and all it's not yeah. like oh yeah i remember we did this and it was so fun but it was like no i remember oh yeah i remember when he did this oh god you know but it's no, there's there's some all. there's some dark stuff in there yeah. there's some disappointing stuff in there there's some sad stuff people die 
you know, people got married and divorced. I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I don't have to tell any of the listeners here, even beyond Comic-Con, obviously, just stories about Stanley and Jack Kirby and oh. what happened to the Superman guys and, and Bill Finger and, you know, or even outside of the comics realm, of course. I mean, just things that have happened over the years in Hollywood and so forth. So there's certainly a lot there. And, you know, even in discussing Comic-Con, you know, there's a lot of discussion I mean, there's an entire chapter about the founder, um, you know, Shel Sheldorf, and you know, he was a controversial guy, and you know, there some people loved him and some people hated him, yes. and really hated him. I mean, there are people yeah. who I actually a few of the people who had some very negative things to say about them, I I uh, either knew just because I, I got to know them well, or would actually ask them, "Are you sure you want me to put this in because yeah. I don't want to make yes. anyone look, you know look too bad or anything." Yeah. And they were like, yeah, you know, I, I want that to be known that I really dislike that person a lot. And, you know, Shell was not the only one that was true of, of course, mm -hmm. but because he was such a Citizen Kane type of character, yes. and so nuanced, and there was a lot of good and a lot of bad. I will say, and this is the point made in that chapter and throughout the book, that I think it's very interesting that the people who really disliked him quite a lot, wish they never met him, are glad he's dead, still mm -hmm. said that there would not be a Comic-Con without yes. Sheldorf. Every single one. There's two people, and I'll let people read the book to find out, in particular, that really disliked Shell uh -huh. uh, quite quite a lot. And I've gotten to know both of them quite well, and they really mean it. I mean, they still they almost obsess over him in a way. Uh -huh. um, and both of them, along with everyone else, agree that to his credit, though, there wouldn't be a comic on without Shell. And so that says a lot that even yeah. his biggest haters still give him that credit. Yes. Um, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna start off get start getting into the book because I'm gonna start off and actually this I only took a part of the quote from actually this is the last quote from the um the final page of the book is that um Shell Dorf says, and I'm using a partial quote to fit this, is that we have created this yearly event with a specific object of sharing in mind. This one place where you can feel at home, share your likes and dislikes during the next three days. Now, of course, remember, ladies and you know, listeners, this is years ago when this came out um, or when he said this. Many of you will make friends and perhaps lifelong friends will be formed right here at this convention. This has happened before. Um, so, again, you know, listeners, you know, as Matthew said, you know, um, um, and Sh Shell, D D D D D how do you pronounce his last name? Dorf, Sorry. Yeah, Dorf, Dorf, yep. was the guy who literally was the founder of Comic Con. Yeah, every everyone would agree. It's it's a little hard to say exactly, just because so many people were involved in the creation of it. Yeah, even, even a section where some of the other people are considered co-founders are like, well, I don't know if I would consider myself a co-founder. Yeah. So, oh, I'm a co-originator, just because it really was a bunch of kids who just wanted to put together this gathering where they could meet their 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 heroes like Kirby and Ray Bradbury yes. and Forey Ackerman and others. Forey Ackerman who created famous Monsters of Film Land and Vampirella amongst others. Um, and I mean, they, they were children. Some of them were as young as 12 years old, like yes. Gary Alfonso, who was not just, he was not getting coffee for people. He was doing publicity. He was yeah. getting the local media and such. I mean, they yeah. all had to have their moms drive them around and whatnot. Yes. So, but, but at the end of the day, even with some of the confusion and lack of recordings back then and whatnot, Everyone does agree that Sheldorf should be considered the founder, um, although there were a lot of people, like at least a good group of about six or seven people uh -huh. who, you know, really also helped to make it happen, whether it was helping to get the funding that yes. was needed or the ideas for it. I mean, there are even some, and this, this kind of came up in the MTV oral history, I Want My MTV, uh -huh. um, that came out a few years ago as well. Um, they they talked about the same thing about who really created MTV. Even that's yeah. kind of hard to say. Uh -huh. um, um, and I found a similar kind of thing even with Nickelodeon because uh -huh. it, it, with something like this, it's so hard to say because there's so many different people involved. Yes. And there was different iterations of it as well. It wasn't even called Comic Con at first. Yeah. They actually had this weird little mini con yes. uh, to raise money for. I mean, there was so many different things yeah. going on, so many different moving elements. But through all of that it's it's pretty much the standard coda you know that that shell dorf create mm -hmm. you know is the founder like period and mm -hmm. i think some of that give it to him also just because they they maybe feel a little bit bad that he that he didn't have much else going on in his life from everything mm -hmm. i understand and yeah there's even kind of a sad part this is one of the warts and all parts 
where one of the other people who helped to really get it going in the beginning, one of the other adults in the room, you know, Shell was the adult at 36. Yes. Everyone else was like a kid. Yeah. But Shell was 36. There was another guy named Ken Kruger. Yes. And he's long past, but we did get to talk to his son, Gus, who was very helpful for this um, and has done some promotional events with us and whatnot. But uh, Ken was really pretty much one of the guys helping to fund it because, mm -hmm. again, he was one of the other adults, just could, um, and also had a, a bookstore that everyone kind of hung out at right. um, where they sort of met each other and kind yes. of was used as their clubhouse mm -hmm. when they were coming up with the idea for Comic-Con. Mm -hmm. And the, the sad part in the book is when Gus Kruger, Ken's son, says, um, or someone else says, that actually, it's Jim Valentino, I'm sorry, um, who would go on to help to create uh, Image Comics, of course. He was another early Comic-Con mm -hmm. guy. But he said he once actually asked Ken, you know, so many people did so many things why why ken did you give kind of the credit to shell as the founder and ken said something along the lines of you know i have my wife i have my kids i have my house i have yes other work that i do shell's got nothing else like yeah. this is all shell's got mm -hmm. and i think a lot of people felt that way about him i mean toward especially toward the end of shell's life it sounds like i yes. never met the man i never talked to him he died in 2009 i mean i you know i don't and there's very few recordings of him there's not a lot of them out there mm -hmm. um and uh it seems like you know, things got pretty tough for him toward the end. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, as much as he also apparently did some things that really upset a lot of people, um, you know, his story sounds kind of like a somewhat of a sad one. Yes. Um, and yeah, but he also created Comic-Con. So yeah. that's one thing we can give him. And I, I, I haven't been able to confirm this, but I know I read this somewhere. I heard of it and it kind of makes sense. But from what I understand, Shell on big bang theory and young sheldon yes. is named after sheldorf i oh. i haven't been able to confirm that but oh, i'm yeah. certain mm -hmm. so i've been researching this and reading yeah. about it for years i yeah. actually did an article for bleeding uh cool a few years ago about this and i've done similar kinds of projects mm -hmm. in the past since 2014 about kind of comic-con and con like things yeah. talking about this and i really remember reading that somewhere and in a reliable source like not wikipedia or anything about yeah. <laughs> so i i can't remember where i saw it i've tried finding it yeah. i can't and I, i'm mm -hmm. quite certain and it makes yeah. sense because i know some of the people involved in big bang theory and they definitely are all surprise surprise big comic-con people mm -hmm. so from i believe that's possible but yeah. you know maybe that's part of the mythology of it all but i think that shell is named after shell oh, okay all right Sorry, Matthew, let me just, uh, I just want to close this little section up and start talking about the mini con. Um, yeah. So basically, so, you know, listeners, you know, please, I'm just encourage you to pick up the book because, you know, um, as Matthew said, that there's a lot of people that were involved in the very early day and literally high schoolers. I mean, these are not, these weren't businessmen. These were high schoolers who had literally, and forgive me, and I, I don't mean to offend anyone, but literally had no idea what to do. It was kind of like, yeah. hey, let's no, get a they, band they, together. They said the same thing. I mean, <laughs> and you know, you got to remember, not only were they kids, and some of them were junior high, like Barry Alfonso, who was, it was 12. He was 12 years old when he was doing all this. And again, not just, you know, getting coffee or, you know, but supply. <laughs> he was helping to run publicity um, with radio stations and stuff. Um, but, you know, this was still kind of a new thing too. Yes. Like, Comic-Con certainly was not the first convention that yes. would have been it, what's considered the first fan convention, and it was still more science fiction and a bit of cosplay, mm -hmm. is the World Con in 1939 in New York. Mm -hmm. World Con, which continued to keep going in different yeah. versions throughout the years. I, I think it still goes on in some, some way, mm -hmm. even today. But um, And Shel Dorff, actually, even though he was originally from New York, I believe, uh, he spent a lot of time in Detroit with his family before he yes. came to San Diego. Mm -hmm. And in Detroit, he was helping to run something called the Tr Detroit Triple Fanfare. Mm -hmm. and that's yes. been going on for a few years as well. And it's actually a big part of why when he got to San Diego, he wanted to do something similar. Yes. So even for Shell, the creator yeah. of Comic-Con, was mm -hmm. influenced by an earlier one. So a lot of people think that San Diego was the first. It by far was not. And what's considered actually the first comic convention is was not the New York Comic Con now, which started in 2006, but an earlier version of the New York Comic Con, which was something different, but it was mm -hmm. also New York that started in 1964. That's considered the first comic book convention. Mm -hmm. um, so you can go all the way back to 1939 for the first 
mm -hmm. fan convention. You mm -hmm. can go to 1964 for the first comic book convention. By the way, fun story there, only 65 people came. <laughs> but the first person to have bought a ticket, according to record, was a young man who would become a writer later on in his life named George R.R. R. Martin. Um, and uh, yeah, that's 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 written in the history books. Um, and who knows if he was the first or fifth or just there. Yeah, but but he was the first person to buy a ticket to the first ever comic convention was George R.R. Mm -hmm. R. Martin, which I think says a lot about mm -hmm. who these people are and who they end up being. And one thing I always like to tell people too is is you know that's why Comic Con was so special is you look at the biographies in the back of the book of which yes. I try to be as extensive as possible. So mm -hmm. much of this is about giving these people the much deserved spotlight that they get. So it's not a typical bio in the back where I have like one or two lines and that's it. Mm -hmm. Some of these bios are a paragraph long. Yes. A lot of people have done a lot of amazing things and I really wanted as much of it in there as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at it, every single person who was involved in Comic-Con in the early days either became a writer, became an artist, uh -huh. yes. Jim Valentino helped to create Image Comics. Dave Scroge ended up helping to get Dark Horse really going. You had Scott people who Shaw. Filmmakers, Scott Shaw, who has worked in every possible pop culture field you can imagine, from comics to cartoons, Hanna Barbera, yes. Simpsons comics, everything else. So I, it really, and, and those who didn't, the few who didn't became college professors yes. or got very involved in electronics and computers. Yeah. Everyone who was involved in this became something very creative, very innovative, yes. and I would say 90% of them went into an artistic field very high. Wendy All, the woman I talked about yes. before, she went into toy design, and not just any toy design. She became a senior designer at friggin' ha you know, Mattel and Hasbro for yeah. goodness. I mean, she yeah. was working at the highest levels that you can at toys. She was helping to do Barbie for goodness sakes. And meanwhile, when she was a kid, she was at she was helping making Comic Con. And no, but oh, I, you know, sorry, I'm kind of going off the cuff here because I remember reading the story of they were trying to get science fiction writer Harlan Ellison to come. <laughs> yeah. And there's and and there's a story and there's a picture of Harlan Ellison <laughs> holding her and oh, she's yeah. kind of smiling, but she, it, it kind of looks like he's it, sort of grabbing her inappropriately. Yep. Yeah. And he, uh, yep. And you know what? And to her credit, she gave me that picture. She has nothing but fond things to yeah. say about Harlan. She's written about meeting him before. I, Wendy, like I said, is the one I've known the longest. We've known each other for 10 years. She is one of the sweetest, warmest, most generous mm -hmm. people I've ever met. But you know what? She does not suffer fools. She's mm -hmm. yelled at me before. <laughs> she, I've, I've heard her and seen her yell at other people. When yeah. Wendy gets mad, she gets mad. And so if she had any real problem with Harlan, she would certainly say it. And you're right. It's a picture that I have to admit, it looks a little inappropriate. But he's grabbing her in, her in a weird way. And she was fairly young at the time. Yeah. Although so is he still, kind of. Um, so certainly not a photo that would probably fly in this day and age. <laughs> Those are the kind, you know, again, with the warts and all, those are the kinds of pictures and art. And there's a few others like that in there, too. I mean, there's definitely some not safe for work stuff in there, listeners. Uh, you know, I actually am going to be doing as part of the tour that I've been doing for the last six weeks as well. I was invited to do something local around here in the Dayton, Ohio area as part of a library, as part of a teen comic day thing that they're uh -huh. doing. And I actually told them, I said, I just want to be clear. There's some stuff in the book. <laughs> People talking about things and pictures and art that might not be appropriate for younger readers and they said oh it's fine you know don't worry I said, okay but you know they, there's they've seen worse on the walking dead they've seen <laughs> but, you, know, you know what unfortunately for good or ill I, I think that has a lot to do with they're like these kids have seen everything at this point any kid with a cell phone has seen it all at this point and, you know, I wanted to make sure to get that stuff in there. I didn't want to censor anything. I mean, yes. pretty much every photo, every piece of art, every story anybody told me, I put in because I felt like that was my duty was to, yes. I, I've even, you know, obviously not success or art or smarts or whatever, <laughs> but style wise, I compared myself to Andy Warhol as both a filmmaker and as a record producer the story is, and if you see some of the footage of him doing it, it seems like it's true that when he would make some of the films, at least the ones he was more directly involved in, not the Morrissey ones later on, 
but when he would make his films or when he quote unquote produced the Velvet Underground's album, that his thing was basically just to kind of walk away. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of my my jam here is I wanted to create the space. I wanted to create the platform. I wanted to kind of design the 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 book and 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 earlier the podcast in a way that would really give them the freedom to say whatever they wanted yes mm-hmm. to do whatever they wanted yeah. and i really didn't turn anything down unless there was an issue that was a legal issue mm-hmm. or with the photos yeah. and art of course like anything with credits i feel really bad that we weren't able to get in any pictures of brink stevens for example oh my um, god <laughs> she, yeah brink stevens is amazing she's another one i've become yes. really close with i love brink she also was nice enough to do some narration for the podcast yes. series. she did that totally on her own for free it was so nice of her to do that um i wrote the what she said but she was very helpful with that but there's no pictures of brink in there even though she was oh. one of the early comic-con people she ran the masquerade for years yes. she uh, was dave stevens widow she dave actually used her as a model for betty along with of course betty page who she mm-hmm. did and does look yes. like betty page already um you know brings a, a, an exceptionally beautiful woman um and later became uh you know what she refers to as one of the original screen yes. queens um being in movies like sleepaway uh a, a, a summer party massacre and things like that and so i would have loved to have had pictures of brink in there yes. the problem was all the pictures she sent me were clearly very professionally done mm-hmm. and i was worried like they were from yeah, magazines totally. or from yeah. other things and i didn't want to cause any issues for me for my publisher or anyone yes. else so i was very meticulous that was really what took the most amount of time mm-hmm. was getting the pictures organizing the pictures mm-hmm. and making sure they were all credited appropriately and identifying as many of the people in them as possible mm-hmm. um, and i understand yeah. from people who are very curmudgeonly and meticulous and persnickety all these old comic-con people who you know again do not suffer fools gladly there's a reason a book like this has never come out before because they didn't really want to, <laughs> to let anyone do it because they were worried it would get screwed up yeah but they trusted me because the podcast was so good yes but um you know from what i understand there's like one or two very minor errors the photos um that i didn't catch or that maybe somebody who gave me the picture they got it wrong which uh-huh. is honestly probably the case because i don't know who these people are in a lot of i had to go with whoever took the picture or whatever so the point is it seems like they're all right and i think that that says a lot about the um the you know how meticulous we were about making sure everything was right because i I didn't want to piss anybody off and i knew these are the people scott Mm -hmm. shaw wendy others who Mm -hmm. if they see something that's wrong they will point it out and they will really focus on it i didn't want that to happen with this book i wanted everything to be as right as possible i went through the drafts you're right it's like 500 pages it was a lot probably Mm -hmm. 10 or 15 times making sure every word was right making sure every name was spelled correctly Mm -hmm. You know, every every Klinganese, Klingon <laughs> word was re- spelled right. And all these weird, like, science fiction. And yeah. fantasy, you know, some of these things, like these planets. And like, it's like, I want to make sure when they're talking about something, everything was right. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, you know, um, um, the thing, I just wanted to let listeners know, because, like I said, reading this book, as Matt said, it's an oral history. You know, because I remember Brink Stevens. Oh, my God. I still remember her one of her famous covers from Femme Fatale magazine back in the 80s. Oh, my God. And those yeah. of you who remember her as the original Scream Queen, I just thought she was this beautiful actress who's not going to be interested in science fiction. Mm-hmm. And she's just an actress in the book. Oh, my God. She's a marine bio. She studied to be a marine biologist. Yeah, she, she almost got her PhD. And she loves science fiction. She read Robert Heinlein. She talked about how she was like literally an outcast in her in her high school. And I'm kind of going, wait, wait, you, this beautiful woman that I've seen, you know, in pictures in the 80s, was an outcast because you love science fiction. You're a bull, you know, like, and I'm kind of going, oh my god, it, it's like, like us, like you and me, yeah. like you love, you know, monster stuff and yeah. me, comic science fiction. We were like outcasts and. Here yeah. Shell comes and goes, let's make this, you know, let's let's do this convention thing. And holy cow, you got, they had Greg Bear, who's a science fiction writer. And oh my God. But it's amazing to learn of how many people were involved in those early days. Yeah, yeah no, I Brink, Brink's a really amazing person. And from what she's talked about, you know, she has a very high IQ, which I very much believe she's done so much. Yeah. And she's very intelligent and articulate when you talk to her. Um, and you're right. In fact, you know, I, I don't want to put this on her. We've never really talked about it, but a few other people have, including some of the other women, frankly, 
But, you know, a lot of people feel that she might not have known or understood how alluring and beautiful she was when she was younger because she was this outcast who had skipped a bunch of grades and who, as she talks about, people would throw her books in the trash yes. and write on her lockers. She she was the local nerd. Mm -hmm. And so it, a lot of people speculate that one of the reasons why Brink is so cool and why she got in with this group of other misfits and weirdos, despite mm -hmm. the fact that she was you know, very attractive was she just might not have really understood that because she was always the nerd who was bullied yeah. well into, you know, late high mm -hmm. school and early college before she, you know, kind of came to terms with the fact that, oh, you know, aside from being very smart and very capable and, and very interested in science and science fiction, I have this other quality that, you know, maybe I didn't realize at first, which is that, you know, I have a certain look that mm -hmm. allows me to become a model Yes. And allowed her to become an actress. Yes. The fact that she happens to also be very good at it says a lot. And look, you know, here we are 50 years later. She's well into her 70s now. Yeah. And she's still doing it. I mean, yes. she was making movies well through COVID. I mean, Mark Evanier says it in the book. And I looked it up. He's not he's not exaggerating. She's made like 400 films or something like that. Yeah. And she's probably made like 10 in the last year or two. I mean, granted, they're like sub trauma. Yeah. <laughs> we, did get, we did get Uncle Lloyd, Lloyd Kaufman from trauma yes. there as well. But they are like kind of, you know, she would even say, you know, they're not even B movies. They're C and B oftentimes, but she's been in a lot of other she's, stuff. She's, been, she's been in TV and she's been yeah. in documentaries yeah. and, you know, Brink, Brink's one of those people she loves working and she loves doing what she does. Uh -huh. And the fact that she worked so hard, even on the podcast series that we did first, Comic Con Begins, which if anyone wants to listen to as well, it's free on all um, audio platforms, even though we partnered with SiriusXM and Stitcher, uh -huh. which they had just purchased at the time. It's it's available free everywhere. Uh -huh. But Brink worked really hard and did a lot of recording for us. I mean, uh -huh. it's, it's a lot of material and, and had to be, you know, sometimes we had to do extra takes and all this. Yeah um so brink's just one of those people and she's also she's done her own comic books she's done her own books mm -hmm. she's directed her own films mm -hmm. she's done a lot i mean brink's mm -hmm. an amazing person she's really a hero of mine and i love just talking to her i hit her up just the other day actually and awesome. and i'm very proud of the fact that she's still working yeah. well into today and rightly so i mean she's probably working on a movie right now as we speak <laughs> all right um matt we've got literally about five minutes left um the thing is, you know, oh my, and listeners, like I said, we, yeah, we did talk forever. That's just for sure. <laughs> the tip of the iceberg because I, 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 I mean, you know, because I really wanted to talk to Matt about the early days of the mini con. Oh my God, this book is incredible. I mean, the, the pool parties, but then also too, the cool thing about the, um, the, and the, the, the U.S. Grant Hotel was one of the locations. And I love that Brink was also the, um, host of the, comic-con tv and that was a closed circuit um um hotel channel that they could broadcast stuff um the convention from the in inside the hotel that was great yeah i mean that, that was mostly at the el cortez they kind of bounced okay. back and forth to a few different locations in the first couple of years but throughout most of the 70s um they were at a place called the el cortez mm -hmm. um which uh everyone who's involved uh in the book and even some of the creators and fans that i talked to um as well who weren't necessarily involved in the creation of comic-con but were very much present there for a lot of this like sergio aragonis for example like i guess um you know it was so cool to get to talk to um and become friendly with uh, over this over this period um everyone agrees that that was sort of the quote-unquote golden era of comic-con where it was sort of a, a a good collusion of it had been going for a few years. It had been fairly established. They had a nice number of people there, a few thousand people. There were people coming from all over the country, mm -hmm. all over the world, folks coming from Japan, Europe, Mexico, all mm -hmm. over. You know, that's how a lot of the anime and manga stuff came in. And the guys, mm -hmm. the gang from, you know, Heavy Metal in 2000 AD and Mobius and people like this mm -hmm. um, and people coming up from Mexico and things like that. So from all over the world, Thailand and, and Philippines and everywhere. Russia mm -hmm. and whatever, mm -hmm. um, and or at the time Soviet Union, but uh, so you know they're bringing all these different artists, all these different filmmakers, all these different creators mm -hmm. uh, together, science fiction people, um, and hanging out at this hotel, the Orc El Cortez, which from what everyone's talked about, from what I've seen from pictures and things, was this kind of ramshackle building that sounds like it was ready to collapse and should have been condemned. 
but really became their home and they were and it and it had this big glass elevator that they would ride up in and yes. moon everybody and, i mean <laughs> I, the way i've been describing that part of the comic-con story and if ever hint 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 there were to be a say a movie made of all this um i would definitely focus on that period and i would refer to it as boogie nights meets revenge of the nerds and i think that a lot of the oh people involved would agree with that and one or two who i've kind of said that to they're like oh uh, that's exactly what it was um you know it was the 70s everyone's yes. young you talked about pool party. not mm-hmm. everyone was wearing clothes <laughs> um, you know there was obviously drinking drugs rock and roll you know people were protesting you know vietnam and such and and all this and and there was a lot you know you, look you had the underground comics people coming yes. down, you know they're hanging out i mean even people like sergio people like spain rodriguez and trina robbins and these are counterculture people i mean some of the younger comic-con kids even like scott shaw who's pretty big and has always been pretty big um, you know, talks about being a little intimidated by these people. I mean, they, they weren't just the heroes of theirs. They were a little scared of them. I mean, these yeah. are people who are writing about and making comics with an X about and writing, you know, stories and things about, mm-hmm. you know, drug, sex and rock and roll and violence and war and protests and all this, that and the other coming and hanging out with them for the weekend at this weird shitty hotel that they were able to get because it's the only one they could afford. And they turn it into their own utopia they turn yeah. it into their own fan geek you know mm-hmm. island their the own island of misfit toys and that's really what it was yes. and it's beautiful and everyone across the board and this is important too you know women as well as men all said it was completely a safe place mm-hmm. nobody has any negative stories about being you know made to feel uncomfortable mm-hmm being you know like who knows if any of that stuff happened i certainly can't say but it really sounds like it really didn't like zero like not even a little bit like it like and i talked to every possible person that you could talk to who who was there even people who aren't in the podcast or book people that i talked to on the side i had Mm -hmm. the good fortune of having an email exchange with art spiegelman for example of mouse fame of course and others there are a few people who chose to not be involved but they were supportive and i would ask them questions and Mm -hmm. and people i've met on this tour i've done a lot of stuff with trina robbins Mm -hmm. and trust me and trina's written her own memoir which i highly recommend that also came out through fanographics just Mm -hmm. recently last girl standing if anyone was going to say anything negative happened, especially to women, it would be Trina. And Trina has yeah. no negative stories mm-hmm. at all. She doesn't have a single one of someone touched me or someone touched her. Yeah. Or someone did this or that. It really sounds like as wild and crazy and out of hand as it could be, everyone was there to support each other. Mm-hmm. Everyone yes. was there to make it a safe, welcoming, mm-hmm. inclusive place. Mm-hmm. They had, again, early manga, early anime, yes. Howard Cruz, who was doing some of the first gay comics, other people from the LGBTQ community mm-hmm. coming very early on. Yes. I mean, it's just something, and people from different politics, there were, there were conservative people, there were people, and not everybody was sexualized and rock and roll. Some people, you know, didn't like that stuff, but they were able to be there too. It was really a place that brought together everybody. And I know we're wrapping up here, and I think this is, you know, a good thing to say toward the end and I've written about this and talked about this I think that's what's so beautiful about this and why so much of this resonates mm-hmm. I think it also goes to why almost all these people are still friends with each other and these are people yes. who literally grew up with each other yeah these are people who've known each other since they were 12 13 years old some of them are in in their 80s now they're still very close friends mm-hmm. um, you throw in someone like Floyd Norman the first black animator for Disney he literally worked on Snow White and Cinderella mm-hmm. the originals I mean that's mm-hmm. you know, he's still working today um, great guy he's kind of part of this scene he was one of the people again not in the book or podcast mm-hmm. but I've gotten very friendly with he's been very supportive yeah. um, and you know all these they're all still friends you know they're <laughs> Floyd's 90 and he's still mm-hmm. with these people you know and so and I think a lot of that's because they really loved each other they have their fights, they have their bickering, uh-huh. you know, they're human beings. But at the end of the day, this sounds like it was a very special place. And yes. Neil deGrasse Tyson, the astrophysicist, he recently said in his memoir that just came out, that Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con is the closest thing he's ever experienced to utopia ever. And that's coming from a scientist. Yes. And so, I, you know, I think that says a lot about what's so special about this and why, especially right now, mm-hmm. When things are so messed up and there's yes. a lot of division and there's a lot of people yeah. fighting with each other and there's a lot of anger and fear and anxiety, 
it's why telling stories like this and getting stuff like this out there is so friggin' important to remind people that, you know, skin color and religion and background and politics and sexual identity and, and all these other things, you know, there, there are places that we can, we can come to, or we can mm -hmm. all agree and say, Hey, you know, let's talk about star Wars. Let's talk about Batman. Yeah. Let's talk about twilight zone. Let's talk about Rick and Morty. Let's, you know, let's, let's, let's discuss these things and, and be there together despite our backgrounds and whatnot. And I think that's really beautiful and important. I don't think it's escaping and I don't think it's, yeah. it's a distraction. I don't think it's looking the other way. These are all people <laughs> right now, even who are very engaged in politics, very mm -hmm. interested in what's going on in the world. These are not people who, who are letting that stuff go. They're not ignoring mm -hmm. what's going on in the world, yeah. but they're coming to a place for each other and for their mental health and for, you know, humanity as a whole all over the world. It's, mm -hmm. it's San Diego Comic-Con International now. It's literally what it's called um, of let's come together and find where we can connect. And if that happens to be on Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, so be it. You know, yeah. let's not worry about that other stuff for a minute. Yes. Let's just come together and find where we can connect. And that's in mm -hmm. storytelling and art and creativity. And that is what this has all been about for me and why I think this is a very important story, especially for right now. Matthew, I want to say mahalo. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to interview you about this important book, this amazing book. You know, um, I wish you all the success um, for the book. Again, listeners, it's See You at San Diego, an oral history of Comic-Con fandom and the Triumph of Geek Culture by Fanographics. It's available on Amazon right now. Now, listeners, if you've already picked it's, up- It's book, everywhere. People can order everywhere. it everywhere. It's, 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 I always tell people, support your local bookstore, support yes. your local comic book shop. If you do get it on Amazon though, even if you don't, and Jason, I've told you this too, so hopefully yes. you can do it also. We can use as many reviews on Amazon as possible. It really helps to push the recommendation algorithm. So even yes. if you get it at your local bookstore, which I hope you do, still do a review on Amazon because it really okay. helps. <laughs> All right. And then I also want to thank um, Hannah um, of Superfan Promotions. And I also want to give John Suntress of Ward Bruin um, a big shout out to, um, because when I saw John, uh, when I saw you on John's um, podcast, um, um, right before the book came out, I said, oh my God, I got to get Matthew on. Yeah, John's great. John's a really, John's so, John really believes in what he does. John and I have become extremely close over the last mm -hmm. few years. This is not the first time he's interviewed me for a project. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was actually connected to him through Aftershock when I did You're Obsolete. Mm -hmm. And th th what they said was, this guy sells books. You got to talk to him. I said, okay. We had a great conversation um, and we became friends. He invited me through a friend of his uh, to the convention in Connecticut, Terrificon. And we did a panel there, which was great. And since then, we've become friends. I'm actually helping him with another project he's working on. John's John's one of the true real guys. And if anyone's not familiar with Word Balloon, uh, they should definitely listen to it because he gets all the big names on there. He really is is one of one of the key people in the podcast realm for this kind of stuff. So John's great. And as he always calls himself, he's one of the original Mercury astronauts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> so now, um, if you are a new comic book reader or, and, you know, and of course a convention goer, you know, Please pick up this book. You know, um, again, it's See You at San Diego, San Diego, an oral history of Comic Con fandom and the triumph of geek culture. Um, I, I just have to say, I love the, how the format is. It's an oral history, like like me and Matt have talked about before we started recording. It's like you're sitting in the room listening to, you know, um, some of the original committee members. You know, listening to um, and and you know, Matt got like Frank Miller. I love hearing the stories of um, from Bruce Campbell, um, but also too, I love some of the original some of the original committee members talking about how some young kid in the seventies came up to go, hey, I, I you know I did this movie, I can probably bring a clip to show it at this convention, and it was Mark Hamill, and I, yeah, that that's amazing. Or you could read the incredible story of how um, Neil Gaiman had talked to. Uh, had talked about he, um, the panel, one of the Comic-Con, recent Comic-Con panels where um, I think they forgot how to have um, have a way for him to exit out of the room. And I think one of the organizers had to find like these, you know, these cosplayers that are like six plus dressed as Klingons to give him like a, 
lined up for him to give him away to get out of That's one of my favorite stories for sure is we did get Neil game and Neil's been great. I was actually just talking with one of his assistants earlier today about some stuff. Neil's been one of the people who's been really supportive of this project since day one when we were still doing the podcast. And, you know, yeah, Neil, Neil tells a very funny story about how they were worried that he wouldn't be able to get out without getting mobbed by the audience. So they just brought together a bunch of people cosplaying as Klingons who were really tall and big to basically escort him out so that he wouldn't get mobbed. And as he says, you know, that's, that's just classic, you know, Comic-Con logic. And Neil's like, Neil's got, you know, as you said, most of the book, a lot of the focus is on the early Comic-Con people. They're the ones that I talked to the longest and, and had the most time, frankly. I mean, Neil's not somebody who has three hours that he can do an yeah, interview, yeah. doing a million interviews a day while he's doing all these TV shows and books and such. But he gave us a, a good interview and um, he had a lot of really funny, interesting yeah. stories. And, and some of them are not so funny. He was another one who he's got some sad stories about Kirby. He's got some sad stories about how Comic-Con has changed a lot over the years, how it's mm-hmm. a lot less intimate now. Other people feel that that's a good thing because it's bigger, so it brings in more people. So, you know, again, it's a lot of different voices. But Neil's definitely one of the ones who he respects and appreciates and loves Comic-Con. But uh, he, like a few other people, wishes it was still a little bit more intimate and one-on-one mm-hmm. and people could really kind of hang out with each other and that he certainly can't do that anymore because, yeah. you know, he would get mobbed. Yeah. Um, and even, you know, frankly, uh, you know, I don't think I'm, I'm giving anything too much away with this, but one of the reasons Mark Hamill can't really go anymore is for that, especially with his age and whatnot. Like he just yeah. can't, I mean, but as they say to, um, you know, I think it was Scott Ackerman who we also talked to from comedy bang, bang mm-hmm. and, and Earwolf and all that, and also writes X-Men and, and other things. He said, you know, he knows for a fact, and I'm sure everyone's heard this, that, you know, that like Jack Black will go and wear a Stormtrooper helmet. So yes. you never know who's next to you in a cosplay. It might be a celebrity. Who, and but that also says a lot about like even for people like that, they they want to go to Comic Con and they want to really see it and enjoy it as a fan, and and not be mo- not be mobbed and not be bothered. Like it's something they want to go to too and kind of mm-hmm. be left alone to just check stuff out. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, so that's another reason to go to Comic Con, kids. Is you never know who's standing next to you, what waiting in line. It might be someone that you are a big fan of and just you know is wearing a mask so that they're hidden away. So. All right. So. Um, I want to give, um, I want to thank Drew, the Colts of Comics for Fun and Profit for putting this episode together. So Drew, thank you very much for all your hard work behind the scenes. And if you are a new listener, please check out new episodes of Comics for Fun and Profit. Before I do my closing line, I just want to end this with um, Brink Stevens and I her quote. I had to cut her quote. I had to make it short. And I love it because it, it just nails how Comic-Con was create from the past to the present. It's just amazing to me that this little group of teenagers had created something that is so huge, so world famous now. It's astonishing to me that we didn't know what we were doing. We just wanted to do something and this is what happened. And that's true. Listeners, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening to this episode. Again, Matthew, thank you very much. I know we're going a little bit over. Until next time, guys, aloha. Our LCS is Cowabunga Comics out of Oconomowoc, Wisconsin, and their mail order company, Deep Discount Comics. Um, and we went there, and, and we were actually invoice number 0001. We are the we were the very first <laughs> their very first customer, um, which was kind of cool. They've been nothing short of fantastic customer service wise. Discounts they were very close, if not the same or better than DCBS on a lot of things. Um, mm-hmm. Over and above uh, customer service wise, always taking care of us, going the extra mile, so responsive, getting instantaneous. Uh, responses back to uh, questions about things and to the point where knowing the stuff you like and anticipating your needs and having it suggested to, that you might want to add this to your order already uh, before you even have to think about about it that's kind of cool really quality experience so we, we love working with Calabunga and Deep Discount and that's why they're in our show notes every single episode and have been for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of episodes Mm -hmm. that we leave them there because we like them they're cool good people that's why they're in there by god 
they'd tell you to if you've got a local comic book shop that you love, stay with them because every everybody needs to support their local comic shops. But if you're looking, check them out. You can check them out in in the show notes. There's plenty of ways to get a hold of them. Either get on their list just so you can check and see what kind of FOC and pre-order stuff they have and the discounts, and they'll send it to you um, each month, get you on that email list. And you can check out their shop because they have a great shop of exclusive Cowabunga Mm -hmm. variants. Amazing stuff. Yes, they've always been there for us, and we take them for granted. So there you go. Now you you know. 